afternoon, everybody. This is very exciting. Um, we've got um, a wonderful presentation today. So Travis Gilbert is um, with us. He, Travis is a member of our board of directors. He, um, until very recently, was the educator at the Old Baldy Foundation. Some of you may have seen him there. And um, a couple months ago, he became the executive director of the historic Wilmington Foundation. So he knows a great deal about the history of the area and he is going to be portraying Sonny Dozier and then um, giving us some information about that. And then we're fortunate enough to have some family members of Sonny Dozier here with us also. So hopefully um, they'll be uh, interested in, in telling us some things too at the end. So um, Travis, take it away. Right. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, this was uh, pretty fun. I um, got to speak with uh, Catherine here, uh, who is the uh, great, great granddaughter, you get that right, of James Henry Dozier, and then her mother, who's the great granddaughter of James Henry Dozier, who's Trudy, is with us. So thank you both for sharing all your family history with me the other day. Um, I definitely learned more about the Dozier family than I had known before. And um, it was really nice to uh, portray Sonny Dozier. Uh, we decided, as you'll see in the video, to portray him when he was my age, 28. So the year is 1871. And I'll elaborate on his life back in Smithville and Baldhead Island uh, after the video during our presentation portion. Right, can everybody see that? Well, good afternoon. Hi there, how are y'all? My name is James Henry Dozier, but you can uh, call me Sonny. Most folks in town call me Sonny. Uh, they say I, I'm Sonny perhaps because I take after my father, uh, Charles Gauze Dozier. Certainly don't take after my mother, Susan Dunbar Davis Dozier. Uh, the year is 1871 and I am uh, 28 years old. I'm not home in Smithville, I'm up here in the big city of Wilmington, up here in the port of Wilmington. I'm up here because I need to find a job and I've been circulating jobs. Hard, uh, times have been hard here after the American Civil War and as a Confederate veteran it can be difficult to find jobs in this uh, reconstructed Old North State. But more about that later. I was born uh, in July 13th, 1843 at my family's Smithville home there on West Moore Street. It's a beautiful two-story house with a double piazza. But much of my childhood and much of our family spent time at our family's plantation out at Fraser's Neck. Uh, there's a place called Dozier's Landing there now. Uh, my family, uh, that plantation went back uh, several generations. My grandfather, he's known in the community as Colonel Dozier, uh, he had that plantation and then my father inherited it from his uh, brother upon his brother's death back in 1843. Uh, we grew uh, all kinds of sorts of things out there. We had uh, several enslaved people that uh, did the uh, growing, uh, but uh, during the late Civil War, there was a salt works there. The Confederates, uh, the Confederate Army and the population, they needed salt to preserve meat. So my uh, family operated a salt works there along the Elizabeth River. That's how you reach Dozier's uh, Landing or Dozier's Neck, Fraser's Neck. Uh, called a variety of names. You might know it by one of the three or all of the three. Uh, but you go up the Elizabeth River uh, from the Cape Fear River, back behind Fort Caswell, and then you go up Dutchman's Creek. And there, there's a place called Dozier's Landing, and that's where my family's plantation was. So, although I was born in the, the Smithville town home because it was July, and uh, we went to town during the month of July to escape the yellow fever and the disease out in the plantation, out in the swamps, uh, we spent much of my childhood out at the plantation. Now, my father, uh, Charles Goss Dozier, uh, he spent much of my childhood being a river pilot, and uh, he also was a farmer as well, but 
uh, several generations of my family members were, were river pilots. Uh, we know these uh, waters well, uh, just like the mighty Cape Fear River here behind me. Uh, now, the river pilots, you might ask, well, their role was they would go out and meet these vessels arriving from all across the world, out beyond the bar in the Atlantic Ocean between Fort Caswell and uh, Bald Head Island, or Smith Island, you might know it as. And uh, my father would uh, use all his skills that he's accumulated after years of sailing and plying these waters to get those ships up over the bar and into the mouth of the Cape Fear River to safely harbor in Smithville. And then uh, other pilots, my father was a harbor pilot, but other pilots would take them about 20, 30 miles up here to the port of Wilmington where they would offload their goods. Uh, but times were uh, tough before the Civil War there uh, as well. We had several panics, financial collapse, so uh, trade ebb and flowed throughout the years. And right before the Civil War, my father was a simple farmer. He gave up uh, piloting and he became a farmer out of the uh, old plantation at Fraser's Neck upon the death of his brother. My father, out of anybody, or my family out of anybody, they, we know and we understand how treacherous these waters certainly can be. Uh, back in the 1830s, uh, about, I don't know, 10 years, a little under 10 years before I was born, my grandfather and my grandmother and many of my aunts and uncles, they died in a, in a tragic boating accident in the Elizabeth River. Uh, seven out of uh, the 10 children that my grandfather had, they perished, including my grandfather and my grandmother and uh, a young woman, a Methodist minister, and, and an enslaved woman as well. Twelve people perished uh, when their small little sailing sloop uh, collapsed in the Elizabeth River. Uh, tradition says that a, a freak storm, uh, a squall came up, uh, you know how those uh, summer days are, it was August, and uh, the boat perhaps was a little too overburdened. There were too many people on that boat. Well, my father, Charles, was on that boat, and he was one of only three people uh, to survive that boating accident. An enslaved man named Fortune uh, was my father, Charles's fortune. That enslaved man helped my father and several others uh, cling to the capsized boat until help could arrive. So my father doesn't really talk about that accident much. You can imagine watching his uh, brothers and sisters die, his mom die, his father die by drowning in the river. Uh, it's uh, not too fond of a memory for my father Charles. So he doesn't speak about it much, but the way my father speaks about that memory is, is always teaching us children, my brothers and sisters, the power of water and how dangerous water can be and how you must respect that water. And a certain kind of civic mindedness for the people of Smithville that uh, we help those in need when uh, they are in distress out in the waterways that surround our community. And uh, you see that as my father being a river pilot for some time there during my childhood. And uh, certainly uh, we get back and forth between Smithville, not by horse and buggy, but by the same waterway. So we pass the Elizabeth River and Dutchman's Creek right where that disaster happened. And uh, you can tell my father gets uh, kind of uh, quiet and cold uh, when we pass that spot where he clung to life. But fortunately, uh, he survived and he married my mother, Susan. And then July 13th, 1843, uh, they had me. Well, I was uh, in my teenage years river piloting like my father uh, when the American Civil War broke out and uh, there was quite a energy in Smithville to uh, join the army, uh, defend our uh, homeland here in the southern states against the Yankee invaders. Uh, North Carolina did not take so politely Abraham Lincoln's call for 75,000 volunteers to invade uh, our brethren southern states. So after North Carolina seceded, young men like me in Smithville, we uh, joined the call. And I uh, joined a, a company that ended up forming part of the 30th North Carolina Infantry. And during 1861 and the spring of 1862, we spent plenty of time around Smithville guarding uh, this uh, battery called uh, Battery Bowls, and eventually it was going to be called Fort Fisher. 
over on the old Federal Point that we renamed Confederate Point uh, across the Cape Fear River up by New Inlet. Well, uh, by late spring of 1862, as it was creeping towards uh, the campaign season, all soldiers know that the fighting happens typically in the spring and the summer, uh, our services were needed to defend the Confederate capital up in Richmond. So me and the 30th North Carolina Infantry, uh, we uh, joined D.H. Hill's troops and we went north to defend the capital against this invading Yankee army that was working their way up the peninsula from Fort Monroe, uh, Fortress Monroe they call it, on up towards Yorktown, Williamsburg, and approaching the capital. So my first uh, time of seeing the elephant, as us soldiers call it, or uh, losing uh, uh, my naivety about battle and war, uh, that occurred during the Battle of Cold Harbor. Well, later on in the war, we fought another battle there, so we often refer to that as Old Cold Harbor, or sometimes Savage's Station. It was a part of a larger campaign that we ended up calling the Seven Days. It was seven days of brutal fighting, and that uh, ended up being my first time really seeing battle. Well, we defeated that Yankee invader, the Army of Northern Virginia and us, and we fought them back the whole way down the peninsula to Fort Miss Monroe, and our Commander General Robert E. Lee thought that we might invade the North. We might bring this battle to the Northern states and help our brethren Southern states that had not seceded, such as Maryland, to join the Confederate States of America. Well, we ended up meeting the enemy once again in Western Maryland at a place uh, we call Sharpsburg, but the Yankees call Antietam, named after Antietam Creek that flowed through the battlefield. 30th North Carolina Infantry, we had dug in in the middle of General Robert E. Lee's line uh, in an old sunken road. We had sold uh, the road was sunken after years of wagons traversing that road to reach a grist mill down by that Antietam Creek. Well, we dug in and waited for the enemy to arrive at about midday, that fateful September 17, 1862. The enemy attacked. It was uh, part of Sedgwick's division, the same troops that we had fought against down on the peninsula when I had my baptism of fire. Well, after waves after waves of us defending that sunken road, which afforded us some uh, little bit of cover against the hail of bullets being fired our way, we were overwhelmed and we were flanked on the uh, eastern or right hand side, and we had to uh, pull out of that sunken road. We ended up retreating towards a battery that was in an orchard that was behind us. And on my way of retreating towards that orchard, I was uh, killed here, or excuse me, I was wounded uh, in my foot. And to this day, y'all, I, I still limp on that foot. Uh, I have a terrible limp, and it doesn't help in terms of finding employment up here in Wilmington. Uh, there's very little employment here in Reconstruction Smithville, but up here in Wilmington, I'm found uh, some sense of job security from my growing family down in South or Smithville. But uh, this foot injury, still limp from it, from that battle wound at uh, Antietam. I was evacuated to a field hospital in this place called Shepherdstown, Virginia. And I was there in an Episcopal church. And the port is uh, busy today, as you can hear, the, all those uh, barrels of turpentine being rolled uh, down the docks. Uh, waiting to uh, go out to the open sea with all that noise behind me. Uh, well, after recuperating from my wound, I rejoined my brethren in the 30th North Carolina Infantry, and we fought at Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, the whole way up in Gettysburg, probably the biggest battle of the late Civil War. We fought at a place called Oak Hill or Oak Ridge on the first day, July the 1st, 1863 at the Battle of Gettysburg and was part of Ramser's Brigade and uh, Rhodes Division during that battle. Well, fortunately, we escaped uh, undue harm. It wasn't like an Antietam, but uh, the Army of Northern Virginia was wrecked and uh, we would never reach that high water mark after the Battle of Gettysburg. So I was a lieutenant by that point. And there was a shuffling in the army in early 1864, and I actually was transferred uh, before fighting picked up again to the 20th North Carolina Infantry, where I served as a first lieutenant. 
and I served with the 20th North Carolina Infantry, uh, the Battle of the Wilderness, the Spotsylvania Courthouse, made it the whole way down to Petersburg during the siege lines, and then General Robert E. Lee thought a third invasion of the North, the first being at Antietam, the second being Gettysburg, the third invasion of the North might relieve uh, the tension, and relieve uh, the army that was trying to defend that Confederate capital up in Richmond. So I joined uh, General Jubal Early's third invading force, and we worked our way up through the Shenandoah Valley and thought our fought our final battle on northern soil, a place called Monocacy, along the Monocacy River outside Frederick, Maryland. And I escaped uh, harm during that battle. We made it till we could see the steeples of Washington, D.C. and the Capitol Dome during that third invasion, but we didn't have enough troops. We didn't have enough troops to capture the federal capital. So we retreated back through Shenandoah Valley and then back on to Richmond. And of course, the war was wrapping, wrapping up to a close at that point. And I was with the 20th North Carolina Infantry when we surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse in April of 1865. And I made that long walk home. These railroads, walked most of it the whole way back to Smithville, South Carolina. I had ragged clothes. You can see my clothes here aren't the best anymore still. I'm in my work clothes. But, uh, I had to borrow shoes to get home. The shoes were in tatters when I reached Smithville, but love was waiting for me in Smithville. Love of my life ended up being Rebecca. We married in November of 1865, and shortly thereafter had several children. <laughs> and uh, like I've been saying, wasn't any jobs here at Reconstruction Smithville. And with my growing family, with Rebecca and the children, we had to find an arrangement where I could uh, make do for my family. So Rebecca and the children, uh, they lived with my father, Charles, and uh, my mother there in Smithville. And uh, I made my way on up here north of the Cape Fear River to the Port of Wilmington to find work. My father and my mother, they, they needed some uh, liveliness in the household. You'd see uh, not only was their son, me, wounded and forever changed by the American Civil War, their youngest son, my brother, Frederick, killed, was killed during the war. He had served as an aide-de-camp uh, to General Whiting, who was in charge of the Confederate defenses here around Wilmington, including Smithville and Fort Fisher. So my brother, Frederick, he uh, couldn't stand that, uh, even though he was underage, age of 17, he couldn't stand that his brother, me, and several of his friends were out uh, fighting, defending the South. And uh, he decided he had to do something to serve the cause. And it was decided upon by the family he could be an aide-de-camp to General Whiting. Well, unfortunately, when Fort Fisher fell in January of 1865, not only was General Whiting wounded, captured, but his aide-de-camp, my brother Frederick Dozier, was uh, captured as well. They took all those prisoners of war the whole way up to Elmira, New York, and it was there that Frederick died of disease as a prisoner of war. And uh, he's buried up there in Elmira, New York. We don't know where. Must be an unknown, unmarked grave up there in Elmira. That really hit my mother, Susan, and my father, Charles, pretty hard. So, bringing my wife, Rebecca, the children into the household uh, really brought some life back into that household and it was important for my parents to be around their grandchildren trying to mourn the loss of dear Frederick at the age of 17. So I'm up here in 1871 in the Port of Wilmington. I've tried being a school teacher. There's uh, many schools that are being built here like Towson School and Hemingway School. These Northern philanthropists, they're investing money in these southern cities like Wilmington to build public schools. Uh, there's northern states, they call North Carolina the Rip Van Winkle state because we're so backwards. We don't have uh, public education or public schools to educate our children. So uh, I'm up here school teaching. Well, that's not going too well, folks. Uh, don't particularly like it that much. What I would really like is employment with the federal government. I am a, a Republican, 
As my family all knows, uh, it's quite odd to have a Confederate veteran and uh, a Southerner from Smithville with a long esteemed family, descendant of the great famed Colonel Dozier and his son Charles Gaz Dozier. Uh, great lineage of a great family being a Republican, but uh, I tell you, I see what these Northern Philanthropist investment is doing to the Port of Wilmington, and I'd like to bring that investment down to Smithville. And I also would really like a federal job. I'd like to serve either in the Customs House or one of the light ships like Frying Pan, or uh, maybe the Federal Point Lighthouse that was reactivated. Heck, maybe, uh, maybe if uh, the Baldhead Lighthouse is reactivated at some point, I can serve there as keeper. Those federal jobs uh, they are quite lucrative and uh, they have job security for someone who's going to hopefully have more children like Rebecca and I. And since uh, the Republicans control Congress and uh, General Grant is our Republican president, well, a lot of these federal jobs, they go to Republicans. So I'm going to do what I need to to hopefully secure a job here at the Customs House in downtown Wilmington or one of those federal jobs down towards home in Smithville where Rebecca, my parents, and children are waiting for me. So I'm going to go uh, wait for the steamer down here on the dock. Work is done here for the week. I'm going to enjoy a long weekend down home in Smithville and eventually uh, grab a steamer down there on Sunday evening make my way back up here to the Port of Wilmington go to the boarding house I'm staying at get into my good clothes and go back to school teaching until that federal job comes my way it's nice talking to you folks There we go. I was trying to find a place that didn't have all these 21st century items and that just happened to be at the bridge because there's a park and then I realized man how loud the bridge is. <laughs> so please excuse my corny joke about the uh, the barrels of turpentine going up and down the dock. Um, was the And then of course all these ships from the 21st century kept going up behind me. The steamship I didn't mind so much but the yacht was kind of funny. So um, it, it, thank you for, for watching my video. Um, again, my name is Travis. I'm uh, served here as the executive director at the Historic Wilmington Foundation. Uh, and uh, that was a video of me portraying uh, James Henry Dozier uh, when I was his age, uh, when he was my age at 28 in 1871. So as we discussed, uh, he was born on July 13th of 1843, and his parents were Charles Dozier and Susan Davis. And there is some question about whether he was born at the townhouse in Smithville or Southport or the plantation out at Fraser's Neck. And um, from what I understand and what seems to be a consensus for uh, planters in the low country is they would often escape, uh, you know, towards uh, towns like Smithville or Southport uh, for the, what do they call them, the salubrious breezes that were healthy. Um, so I made a, a guesstimation in the video thinking, well, if it were July uh, and his mom was pregnant, they perhaps would be in the townhouse and not out in the plantation in July. Um, there's a, a picture of the Dozier home that Catherine uh, shared with me. And you might ask where the plantation was, uh, this is a map from Benjamin Lewis Blackford, um, part of UNC's collection uh, at uh, Chapel Hill. And although it's from 1864 during the Civil War, you can see when you zoom in, that's Dozier's Landing right there. And it's in this neck of land between the Elizabeth River and Dutchman's Creek, 
before, of course, the intercoastal waterway was dredged. Um, now, you, the, the history is that he was born, or the, excuse me, the plantation was at Fraser's Neck. And you'll notice right here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. I'm going to try to oops, draw here. Right here is when you zoom in, that says uh, Fraser's Landing. So I'm not sure if Fraser was an older term, it was renamed Dozier as the neck because that's clearly a neck of land. Or I, what I imagine is this was all the same plantation, all the same acreage. And you actually notice up here when you zoom in on the map, this is labeled Negro uh, cabins. So that was where the enslaved quarters was. Um, there's a, a tradition that the disaster we're going to talk about from when his grandparents passed away during the boating accident, they were out here uh, collecting chestnuts. Um, and that seems to be refuted in some of the uh, secondary sources, but this is a grove of trees here. So um, it kind of makes sense that maybe the neck is right there and that's where the uh, plantation house would have been, uh, where the neck was, Dozier's Landing, because of course they're using these waterways to access Smithville uh, from the rural countryside. And as you all know today, this has changed dramatically, this entire landscape. Uh, so it was difficult for me and I'm sure difficult for you to get an understanding of where out there uh, it would be. Um, the accident that I talked about in the video, I, I learned this from Catherine uh, in August of 1835, uh, James Henry Dozier's grandparents were returning from uh, Fraser's Neck or Dozier's Landing. Um, and they were in, there were 12 individuals in a small uh, pleasure sloop. Sloop, of course, being two masted. So I gave you, that's a whaling vessel there. So it might have been a little bit larger to give you an idea of what it looked like. And uh, there was a storm or there was um, some sort of mistake and the boat capsized. And uh, James Henry Dozier's father, Charles, was only one of three survivors uh, during that accident. So we actually witnessed his parents and his parents' friends and at least one enslaved girl uh, die along with his brothers and sisters, drown there, including uh, a baby. Um, so I would imagine for Charles, he lived with that memory for the rest of his life because an enslaved man named Fortune helped uh, Charles cling to the capsized vessel and wait for what must have been hours until help arrived. So he was clinging to his life while watching his family and his family's friends um, struggle and eventually lose their lives. So that must have been very traumatic. And uh, with mariners and river pilots and keepers of lighthouses, this would have been an acute, intimate feeling, uh, an understanding for this family, the dangers of the water. Uh, and there's gonna be another tragedy uh, a little bit later we'll discuss. But I just wanted to read, uh, this was in the People's Press, a Wilmington newspaper on the 14th of August, 1835. It says, melancholy disaster we have to record one of the most melancholy and distressing events that ever occurred in our vicinity. On Saturday last, the fifth instant, between 2 and 3 p.m., Colonel Dozier and his wife and family of 10 children, the Reverend Mr. Hankins and his wife and two children, the daughter of Mrs. Miles Potter, Miss Harriet Hankins, sister of the sheriff of Brunswick County, and a Negro girl belonging to Colonel Dozier, were in a small sailboat on our party of pleasure bound from the neighborhood of Smithville up the banks when in the mouth of the Elizabeth River, uh, the boat was upset. Colonel Dozier and wife and seven children drowned. Uh, Reverend Mr. Hankins, daughter of Mr. Parter, and the Negro girl were all drowned as well, making 12 in number. The remainder were saved. Uh, Mr. Mrs. Hankins and two children, Miss Harriet Hankins, three of Colonel Dozier's little boys. Uh, the survivors were two hours in the water, holding to the boat, uh, which was bottom upwards until relief came. Colonel Dozier was a man much esteemed by all who knew him and uh, for his integrity, his industry, and his excellent qualities of heart. His wife and family are amiable and interesting and much beloved. Uh, and it goes on. So I, I can imagine for the entire family, the story 
Uh, that was a, a treacherous, dramatic day that lived with the family and was passed down uh, generations. Uh, so in the 1850 census, this is the first census that uh, James Henry Dozier appears in. You can see he's late, age six uh, with his siblings listed there um, and his parents, Charles and Susan, Charles being 29 and Susan being 26. And Charles Dozier's occupation is listed as a harbor pilot in this 1850 census. And you go to the next census, uh, 10 years later, you see uh, James Henry is 17. So he's 18 years old when the Civil War broke out. And you'll notice that Charles's occupation is changed in, those, in that decade from uh, a pilot to a farmer. And we can assume that he was out uh, at the plantation. He'd given up river piloting and harbor piloting to uh, be a farmer and managing the plantation out at Fraser's Neck or Dozier's Neck Landing. Um, in this decade, from 1850 to 1860, there was, of course, several financial panics that affected the Port of Wilmington. And being a river pilot was becoming increasingly um, sought after and increasingly difficult. Uh, if you're in the club, you're in the club. If you're not, you're not. So I can't assume what happened uh, but I understand of uh, the various pressures that could have pushed uh, Charles Dozier into an occupation as a farmer out of the plantation, as opposed to a harbor or a river pilot. And then, like I said, uh, James Henry Dozier was aged 18 when the American Civil War broke out. And uh, he was in a, a militia group of sorts when the war broke out in the summer of 1861 and didn't fully enlist and get incorporated into the 30th North Carolina Infantry until the second spring of the war in 1862. And he is uh, enlisted and incorporated into the 30th North Carolina Infantry as a sergeant, so a non-commissioned officer. And I think that is a statement of James Henry Dozier's um, esteem in the community. Clearly this man was a leader uh, during the militia occupation and state troop occupation of the Lower Cape Fear during 1861, he made a name for himself, and that was recognized and codified as a status as a non-commissioned officer uh, when the 30th North Carolina Infantry left home here in Brunswick County and went to serve uh, under General Robert E. Lee in the Army in Northern Virginia. And uh, I think probably one of the most fateful battles for James Henry Dozier was uh, the Battle of Antietam, which is known as the bloodiest day in the American Civil War. He was uh, the 30th North Carolina Infantry, and he's serving as a sergeant. He was uh, defending the sunken road. It's now called Bloody Lane on the battlefield. Uh, but that is a photograph taken shortly after the battle by Alexander Gardner. And that shows you the... Um, it gives you a glimpse of what James Henry Dozier witnessed during that battle. Uh, if that's what the aftermath looks like, I, I don't want to know what it looked like in the midst of battle. Um, they were attacked by a whole, uh, two brigades, nearly a whole division of Union troops, and eventually had to retreat uh, out of that sunken road. So uh, I assume he was wounded in the foot on that retreat because the sunken road, the Confederates defended that road, chose to make a line of battle there because from their waist down to their feet, it was defended, it was uh, protected against the embankment of the sunken road. So it seems logical when they were retreating towards a, a, a orchard behind the line of battle, um, that is when he was wounded. But he wasn't captured. We know that Confederate soldiers that were wounded and unable to walk or evacuate themselves were captured in the sunken road. So clearly he was able, or his uh, brothers, his comrades, if you will, were able to evacuate Sonny Dozier behind Confederate lines. And we know all the wounded were taken back across the Potomac River into Virginia to Shepherdstown. Uh, and uh, I was able to call an old friend up from college and was determined uh, that uh, he was, was uh, treated in the Episcopal Hospital there in Shepherdstown. 
Um, it's now Shepherdstown, West Virginia. It's a lovely little community. Around January of 1863 is when he recuperates and uh, he's enlisted back into um, the, the 30th North Carolina Infantry. I have a question. I'm like curious if he got to be able to go home or go to Richmond during that uh, few months leave of absence. Um, some troops were able to go home. Um, others were not. So that'd be a curious question if he was able to get the whole way back to Smithville on leave. Um, but eventually towards the end of the war, he served in a kind of auxiliary sister unit in the 20th North Carolina Infantry uh, up until the end of the war. Um, so both of these regiments and uh, James Henry Dozier um, see the, participate in the largest, most consequential battles of the Army in Northern Virginia. So you read about the American Civil War, you read about a battle, uh, nine times out of 10, 9.5 times out of 10, James Henry Dozier was in the thick of it. Uh, so I think his experiences in the war are extraordinary. Uh, you can easily track his movements. And uh, his younger brother, they call Fred, um, he was serving at the age of 17 as an aide-de-camp to uh, General Whiting, who was the Confederate commander in the Lower Cape Fear region from November of 1862 until he was wounded and captured at the fall of Fort Fisher in January of 1865. Um, and just as uh, James Henry Dozier being enlisted as a non-commissioned officer and achieving the rank of first lieutenant by the war's end, I think Frederick Dozier serving as an aide-de-camp to the Confederate commander in the Lower Cape Fear is also a statement about this family. Um, they certainly, an aide-de-camp was a very official role. Um, it, he would have been educated. Uh, aide-de-camps needed to learn how to read and write very well. Um, so that's, an, again, another statement of these Dozier brothers and their father's uh, presence in the community and their leadership in the community that Frederick was able to attain this role on General Whiting's staff. But unfortunately, uh, most of the Confederates remaining in Fort Fisher, including all of General Whiting's staff, was captured when that fort fell to uh, the Union forces. And all those prisoners were taken to Elmira, New York. Um, Frederick would have survived a, a terrible um, railroad accident. Uh, these uh, prisoners of war, they were put on a railroad and the railroad actually had a terrible accident on the way to Elmira. So, I mean, it's just sad that Fred, he was able to survive the fall of Fort Fisher, survive this railroad accident that claimed even more lives. And then eventually, just like his commander, General Whiting, die of disease up in Elmira, New York. And uh, it's, uh, he, he must be in an unknown uh, plot up in Elmira in the National Cemetery that was created uh, in the 1870s up there in uh, upstate New York. So I, I think it's curious shortly after, I mean, just a few months after returning home, uh, James Henry Dozier marries Rebecca. Um, so, you, so you must assume in a small town of Smithville that they knew one another um, before the war um, or maybe when he was wounded or on leave. We're not sure how many times he was granted leave. He was an officer, so they were afforded more leave than uh, perhaps privates. Uh, you, you must wonder that their courtship survived the war or started during the war. Um, you know, it, uh, th that's where my mind uh, seems to believe. Uh, but she was a descendant from the uh, founders of Smithville. Um, so an illustrious family, just as the Dozier's, I think a, a statement that these two would get married to prominent families in town. And uh, very quickly after the marriage, uh, they had their first children. Um, Sarah Ann, born on the 3rd of February, 1867, uh, known as Annie, and then Gertrude or Gertie. Uh, June the 1st of 1869. And there's a photograph uh, that uh, Catherine Trudy uh, was able to give a, a copy of to the Southport Historical Society. So you can see that in the Susie Carson Research Room. Um, and 
once uh, they have these first children, you can tell in the 1870 census that um, they are living with a grandpa and grandma. And you notice that Charles and James are uh, back to river piloting at this point uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War. Um, you know, several others at home or going to school. And before I talked to Catherine, we at Old Baldy didn't quite understand um, this gap in reconstruction, uh, in the re reconstruction era. Uh, we knew by 1882, he is, uh, St. James Henry Dozier is serving as keeper of Old Baldy, but from the Civil War onwards, we didn't know much about his professional or personal life. And some of the family stories, uh, clearly he was going to Wilmington and uh, he was teaching school, which makes sense when you put it in the context. There is uh, a blossoming of public schools that are established here in Wilmington, and that doesn't even include the private schools. And that uh, those are established uh, due to Northern investment, Northern philanthropists investing in these Southern states uh, for not only uh, black children to go to school, but white children as well. So at this point, I was unable to determine if it was perhaps one of the public schools like the Hemingway School that we lost uh, due to fire in the 70s or Towson School, which is a block away from the office I'm in right now. It still uses the Catholic school in town. So it's kind of cool. The first public school in North Carolina or in Wilmington is still used as a school. Um, so unable to determine if it was one of those schools. Um, from what I understood from Catherine, um, I guess there is, a, he could perhaps be teaching in a freedman school. Um, if there's a statement that he's a, a Republican at this time, certainly the majority of school teachers were teaching at these freedman bureau schools that uh, were all across uh, Wilmington. So uh, at this point, kind of uh, uncertain. Um, but clearly river piloting, school teaching. We know he eventually lands a job in the customs house as an administrator here in Wilmington. He makes a jump from the customs house to serving with his father on frying pan light ship. And then by 1882, he's appointed keeper of um, the uh, Baldhead Lighthouse. Um, so during these 1870s, during this kind of transitionary year, years or decade, uh, two children are born that survive, Frederick and Susan, and then uh, two children unfortunately passed away. Uh, Zebulon and Muriel um, passed away very, very young. Uh, this is very common. Uh, I used to work in a museum where uh, a majority of the children died. Five out of the nine children died. So two out of nine, uh, I think, is a, is a remarkable track record for Rebecca. Um, and in the 1880 census, you can see here, uh, James and Rebecca, they're still living with grandpa and grandpa, grandma and grandpa there in Southport. And as you can see here, right before he's appointed keeper, he, his occupation, it, there is no occupation. So again, another statement of this kind of transitionary years after the Civil War where um, oral tradition says that he's occupying a variety of jobs. Uh, just trying to make do to support this family. And we can assume trying to get that ultimate job that he's going to get here in two years, a uh, keeper of uh, the Baldhead Lighthouse. And that's when he's appointed uh, October 4th, 1882. Um, as a statement here, so uh, Baldhead was uh, in, this, in, in disuse. Uh, it was not reestablished following the American Civil War because the old inlet or the natural access in and out of the Cape Fear River that we know today, it was shoaling terribly. Um, it was getting shallower and shallower. And new inlet, uh, which is closed up by the rocks today up towards Fort Fisher, um, that was the preferred inlet in the years after the American Civil War. Not only was it closer to the Port of Wilmington, but it was uh, much deeper. Um, so there was a third lighthouse up there called Federal Point Lighthouse. The first one, I believe, caught fire. The second one was destroyed by the Civil War uh, because Port Fisher was built literally around this lighthouse. 
And then the third lighthouse uh, was being used up there to allow these ships to find that new inlet. Well, although new inlet was preferred inlet and it was deeper, it was pushing more sand into the river channel beyond the inlet. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, decided in the late 1870s that they were going to build the rocks or that man-made dam we know today to fill in new inlets and as a through dredging and as a natural kind of flush deepen the old inlet between Fort Caswell or Oak Island and Baldhead Island. So it was in 1880 that Federal Point Lighthouse was extinguished for the last time and Baldhead Lighthouse, after about 15 years of being turned off, was reestablished. And you can see there was quite a turnover here um, with Mr. Bell, uh, there was a John Newton, Asa Ross, uh, none of these keepers uh, stick around very long from about 1880 to 1882. But they found a keeper in Keeper St. Uh, James Henry Dozier because he's going to be the longest keeper to ever serve at Baldhead Lighthouse or Old Baldy today. Um, I think the two are inseparable. When you think of uh, Old Baldy Lighthouse, uh, you must think of James Henry Dozier. And uh, the family lived, uh, James Henry Dozier and the later children we're going to discuss, they lived at this keeper's cottage that uh, was to the east of the lighthouse. So I should have labeled this, but you can see here, that is Old Baldy right there. And Southport would be in this direction. This is the creek you access from the Cape Fear River. The Cape Fear River is towards Smithville or Southport, obviously. Well, um, there were all these uh, private residences built around the lighthouse reservation when Old Baldy was in disuse for those 15 years following the Civil War. So the federal government checked on it. So all these river pilots began building these small cottages around the old lighthouse. Uh, they were probably using the old lighthouse as a lookout point uh, for not only new inlet and old inlet, any vessels that could get in through old inlet. Well, when the federal government uh, came back and decided they're going to reactivate Old Baldy, what they did is, and you see this 1883 source, they uh, reestablished the Baldhead Lighthouse. They tore down three private residences and they made the four circled in green the official keeper's cottage. So the federal government didn't build a keeper's cottage. They kind of through eminent domain took in this private residence and said, James Henry Dozier, Rebecca, you're gonna live here. And uh, that was really important, uh, my time at Old Baldy to kind of piece this together because uh, the current keeper's cottage today is a replica of the cottage that James Henry Dozier lived in. And we were never really sure where that cottage came from, how they found the designs, why they chose that specific cottage, because there were three throughout the tenure of Old Baldy. And through this map, uh, McCallie Gibbons, uh, who's the collections coordinator at Old Baldy, was able to find this map. And through a lot of late nights, we were able to piece together the primary resource and decide kind of what happened here. A very, very educated guess, but uh, I, I think we nailed it there. And that's a close up from a Herbert Bamber plan, 1883, of the cottage they lived in. And this is important for some photographs I'm going to show you uh, in a second. Um, but there you have the cottage. This is a full length porch here. This is a detached kitchen. Old Baldy would be behind us here. And uh, this is a cistern with a walkway going into the cottage. So the entrance of the cottage would be there. So uh, again, a cistern, here's the walkway, full length porch, detached kitchen and old baldy behind. Um, this was, I think my favorite picture that Catherine shared uh, with me. That is Charles at a very old age, right before his death. So Charles is James Henry Dozier's father. Um, so I call him grandpa, um, sitting on the porch at Baldhead, um, 
and it must have been in the late 1880s or early 1890s. Um, so he passed away uh, sometime in the 1890s. Um, and then you can see James Henry Dozier behind there uh, on the uh, rocking chairs. I think it's just a really fascinating picture to see them on bald head. And uh, also because we have rocking chairs and I've sat many a times in rocking chairs on that reproduction porch. So it's kind of a perfect capture in time. The, the, the later children I call them, uh, Lillian, Katie right. and Esther, um, they are the, the children that um, were, pro were probably not born on Bald Head, um, but perhaps, but certainly spent a significant amount of time on Bald Head um, growing up. And that is captured in photographs that I'm going to share with you in 1893. Uh, Lillian and uh, Catherine or Katie are depicted in these photographs. Uh, taken by a light hand house engineer in 1880, 1893. Esther is not depicted because we all assume that Rebecca was back in Smithville or Southport uh, preparing to give birth to Esther um, because the photographs were taken in May of 1893. Esther is born in October of 1893. And even today, um, someone who's about ready to give birth, I think we want to keep them in Southport, not on Bald Head. So uh, you can amplify that in the 1890s. Uh, and uh, Catherine and I had a discussion about where these children, like what their uh, kind of arrangement was in between, were they spending a majority of their time on Bald Head? Were they spending some time in Smithville? And uh, it seems like um, at the beginning, uh, they're spending a significant portion of time on Bald Head. We know, we, we have an understanding that the children were being educated at the schoolhouse that was built on Bald Head Island. Uh, along with like Captain Charlie's children and um, some of the other children of keepers and life-saving servicemen or early coastmen on, on uh, Bald Head. But uh, as they age, perhaps um, it shifts and they're spending more time in the Smithville. Um, the, the Bamber photographs, so there are four photographs taken of Old Baldy in May of 1893, and they're the oldest known photographs of Old Baldy. And it's really awesome for James Henry Dozier because he and his family are depicted in these photographs. He's the keeper at the time. So uh, there in that picture on the left, you can see uh, there's the detached kitchen we were talking about out back. And the close up, you can see there's James Henry Dozier standing uh, at attention in his uniform below this uh, mulberry tree there in the uh, gated yard. And of course, Old Baldy behind looks pretty similar. And then here's the two children, Lillian and Katie, uh, on the porch. And you can see the cistern there on the very left um, that we saw in the diagram. And there's the walkway and the full porch. And there's uh, Lillian and uh, Katie or Catherine uh, sitting there on the porch. Uh, we can recreate that photograph today. It's, it's lovely. Um, and then the, there were four, I didn't share the four, we're still trying to uncover some pieces of who's in that photograph. Um, Catherine helped significantly the other day with trying to unpiece that fourth photograph. So I'll just share the third and make this the final for today. And it's my favorite of the four. Uh, there we have uh, Lillian, Katie, and James Henry all standing in front of Old Baldy. Um, you can see Old Baldy's painted all white at this time. Uh, the stucco modeled appearance you see today, that always would have been covered up by, we you know, it was painted all black for a time, painted all white for a time. Um, so other than the white paint, and you can tell up top, there is kind of a wooden um, balustrade uh, around the top where James Henry Dojo would have went out and polished the glass. Um, so other than that and the white paint, looks about the same uh, to Old Baldy today. So just a really lovely photograph. I think Herbert Bamber, who took these photographs, um, he visited every lighthouse reservation in the United States in, the, in this time, around 1893, and photographed them. And what makes these photographs so uh, special is he went at great, uh, he put great emphasis in capturing the lives of these keepers. 
including their family members. Uh, we're so thankful that he did that uh, here at Baldhead as well with the Dozier family. So uh, by November of 1893, uh, James Henry Dozier, uh, they call him captain at this point, just like Captain Charlie's a captain as well. Uh, it's a kind of an honorary title given to lighthouse keepers at this time. Uh, he retires. And there were two forces behind um, James Henry Dozier's retirement. First, um, they wanted to demote James Henry Dozier from a light keeper to a laborer in charge. And that is because of this big secret uh, they have at Old Baldy. Uh, Baldhead Island wasn't really a lighthouse. It was a rear range light, um, which is, you know, a distinction really without a difference when you ask me now that I'm not working at a lighthouse. Uh, but it means that in order to find the river channel, you'd put one light in front of you, and one light behind, and the pilot or the ship captain would try to line up the lights. If they're one above or below the other, you're in the correct angle to be in the river channel. If they're not one to the left or the right of the other, you're in the wrong angle. You might hit a sandbar or whatnot. Well, Old Bali for much of this time was a rearranged light. So not only was James Henry Dozier taking care of the light atop Old Baldy, there was a front range light on a stake somewhere in the beach along West or South Beach on Baldhead Island. So uh, James Henry Dozier was taking care of that light on a stake as well. So that light could be lined up with the light atop of Old Baldy. And if you remember, um, he had that limp um, from the wounding at Antietam. So this is a lot of walking. This is a lot of climbing for a man um, with a, a unhealed kind of wound on his foot and a limp um, would have been very, very difficult. A testament to not only the help that he must have received from the family, um, but his dedication to the job. Well, because it was a range light, the lighthouse service was trying to find um, a way to cut corners. And then in 1903, the third and final lighthouse was built on Baldhead Island out at the pitch of Cape Fear, known as Cape Fear Light Station. It was in operation from 1903 to 1958. Um, that's where Captain Charlie served. So the combination of Old Baldy being a range light and this brand new lighthouse being built three and a half miles out towards the Cape, the lighthouse service said, we're going to demote you and decrease your pay. Well, James Henry Dozier successfully fought that in 1903, and they met him halfway. Um, he had pay cut. Um, he got to keep um, some of the pay he was afforded. And then finally in 1913, they were going to automate this light. So James Henry Dozier, even though he's uh, getting older at this point, um, he's at this point kind of getting pushed into retirement. Uh, or he would have to transfer somewhere else. And they gave him an offer to transfer to, I think it was Mesquita Inlet down in Florida in 1903. And James Henry Dozier was so committed to Southport and Smithville, he said, uh, absolutely not, I'm staying here. So he really, he loved his hometown. Um, so about three years after uh, James Henry Dozier retires, uh, you can see here that his wife passes away, and it was a, a long illness. The family explained it to me that it was a due to cancer, and uh, she was 68 years old. Uh, they were a lifelong uh, Methodists, and uh, you can see there from the obituary published the whole way up in Wilmington, a very beloved lady, and uh, I um, love this line here, kind of shows you, um, talking about now James Henry Dozier, who's known throughout the state. Um, I think it's important to know that not only were these lighthouse keepers operating, facilitating the lighthouses, they also were hosts of sorts. And Rebecca must have played a really important role in being that hostess. Uh, we have newspaper accounts of James Henry Dozier and Rebecca hosting summer Sunday school um, classes on the lighthouse reservation. And, um, church services, which still occur at Baldhead Island under Old Baldy today. Easter, they would have had a service there in the grounds. Um, we have lots of pictures of this time of just like curiosity-seeking tourists 
arriving at a, a bald head island and wanting to see the old lighthouse. And it was expected from the Lighthouse Bureau or establishment uh, that Keeper Dozier would welcome them into the lighthouse, allow them to climb the lighthouse, show them the technology. It was very much an understanding that this is owned by all of us citizens. And uh, that host role, that hostess role of Rebecca, um, I think is where this known throughout the state comes from. So a notoriety that spans not only Southport and Wilmington, but all across North Carolina. So after his retirement, uh, they, they moved into this house at 414 West West Street. And um, after Rebecca died, uh, Esther and John uh, Erickson, uh, who ended up being the mayor of um, Southport, uh, lived with James Henry Dozier in retirement at this house at 414 uh, West West Street. Um, so he, you know, wasn't alone. He wasn't a widower living in this uh, empty house. He had the company of um, not only John, but of Esther as well. Uh, and you can see uh, John was not only an immigrant to um, Smithville or Southport, he was a World War I veteran. You can see Esther and John there at the house. And there's the same house. So I need to uh, to move this bar up so I don't get the names wrong. <laughs> um, there's uh, Katie uh, and Esther, and then the uh, baby, uh, Catherine decided was Sally. And, and please, Catherine and Trudy, please feel free to chime in uh, if, I'm, if and there's any in corrections that need to be made. Um, so we have Esther, or excuse me, Katie on the left, Esther in the middle, the baby is Sally, and then uh, Keeper Dozier there on the staircase behind. Travis, that is Sally. That's my mother's older sister. Okay, yeah, a McNeil. What was a McNeil? McNeil. Mm -hmm. You got it. Thank you, Catherine. You're welcome. Um, so there's the same. You can see uh, it's the same kind of porch um, there on West West Street. So Esther and John, and then um, there are several generations of the family there. So uh, this these photographs I'm showing from the family, I get a sense that this house was very much welcomed and loved by the entire extended family. It was kind of a gathering place. It, it clearly was a gathering place for the entire family uh, after Rebecca died. And uh, here's some more. There's uh, on the left, there's Mr. Dozier, uh, all fancy. It's very, it looks very different than where, when I portrayed him when he was a working man. Uh, he got, you know, came a little bit of a dandy, I think, at the end there. He was really polished and very nicely dressed and was in retirement. Um, and in the middle there, we have uh, four generations of, uh, of Dozier's. We have James Henry Dozier there on the left, and then his daughter, Susie, and then her daughter, Eula. And I wasn't able to determine Augusta. That's how it was marked, but I could not find that in the family tree. Catherine, do That is her daughter, Augusta. She was married to Merritt Moore. I don't okay. know if anyone knows Jimmy Moore in Southport, but that's his mother. And it was John Carr Davis, the sheriff's mother. Mother, I got um, Eula. Okay. Thank you, Catherine and, and Trudy. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, and then uh, there on the very right, there's James Henry Dozier and his son-in-law, uh, John Erickson, uh, when he's a little bit older. He's certainly beyond World War I uh, there on the same porch. And the census, you can kind of follow this in the census. There we have um, James Henry is the head of household, and uh, Katie's living here with him, and his son-in-law, John, and uh, his wife, Esther, all in the same household. So right when these photographs must have been taken, and then again in the 1930 census, now we have John as the head of household, and Esther, his wife, and Esther's, uh, of course, father, James Henry Dozier, uh, living with them, and Katie as well. And it was just four years after that last census uh, that James Henry Dozier passed away. We had the death certificate June 23rd, uh, 1934. Um, and he uh, is buried along with Rebecca and many of the other family members, uh, including his father, Charles, and whatnot, uh, there in the old Smithville uh, burying grounds. And the Old Baldy Foundation, uh, we uh, have a, a marker that designates uh, his service uh, as a lightkeeper 
um, very similar to the veteran markers that you see designated World War II or Vietnam, Korea, and whatnot. We put an American flag uh, on top of that marker. Uh, his father, Charles, has the same marker for his service at the frying pan light ship. So I will um, stop sharing here. And uh, okay, 205, not bad. <laughs> um, I, I would love, Catherine and Trudy, if you'd like to make any corrections, if I stumbled at all in the presentation, and just introduce yourselves and, and share anything you'd like. I, I would, I'm so thankful that you all could join us. You did an excellent job. The only correction I have is that wonderful picture you like that has them sitting on the porch at Ballhead. That was James Henry Dozier on the left. And the other man was Charles Goss, his son-in-law, which oh. is my mother's. It's confusing because his name was Charles Goss too. So. Charles Goss, this, okay. Yes, a wrong generation. Yeah, that, that was Gertrude Dozier Goss's husband. That was um, James Henry Dozier's Son. daughter's husband. Let me try to pull that up so everybody can see um, what we're talking about here. Thank you for that correction. It's I confusing really... because of the names. There it is. There yeah. That, the man sitting in the rocker with the beard is James Henry. And then the man with the pipe and the little hat on is his son-in-law, which Charles, is Mama's, um, my grandfather, Charles mm -hmm. Iden Goss. Like the Goss building in Southport, the Goss house that's being repaired down on House Street. <laughs> that was his. I noted that correction so I can get that to Old Baldy. Um, like I said, so it's confusing. That. There's too many names that are so much alike. <laughs> um. Stop sharing there. Um, Catherine has been so helpful, and I think we're going to try to keep sitting down and talking. Um, and this family and the Newton family, I'm just fascinated by. There's so many layers. Um, so uh, do, do you ladies have anything you wanted to share about James Henry Dozier? I did want to say his, um, James Henry's grandfather, which they call, also called um, Colonel James Dozier, um, who lived at the plantation. His father was Richard Dozier, and he's the one who really owned all of that property. It, it went all the way from Dutchman Creek over to where St. James is now, and up towards um, where Highway 211 is. Um, but his wife's grandfather was Charles Goss, who was the founder, one of the five founders of South so it's, it, it, they're all intermingled, the gosses and the dozers. <laughs> no, I have not, Trudy and I have not had the pleasure of meeting, but Trudy, thank you for joining us. Is there anything that you wanted to share about the Dozier family today? I actually have met you. I talked to you down at the library one day, but. Uh, I apologize. Now I'm. Okay, long time ago. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Um, I, I. I can probably think of a lot of things, but right off the top of my head right now, I can't. I mean, I know many, many more things about them. Because they said, for instance, Susan Dunbar Davis sat over here in Southport during the Civil War and listened to the bombardment of Fort Fisher and knew that her 17-year-old son was over there. So she, uh, and always, they always said that when the, it sounds like a, uh, cannons going off and they call them the Seneca guns. Well, that was actually a ship called the Seneca that was bombarding uh, Fort Fisher. And that's where the saying of it sounds like the Seneca guns came from. When Catherine shared that, I was like, that makes sense. That's the best <laughs> explanation I've ever heard of for the Seneca guns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you were talking. Pardon me? I, so when she sat there and listened to the Fort Fisher, the fighting at Fort Fisher, and knew that her 17-year-old son was over there, then she never saw him again, did she? No. He was oh. captured and died of dysentery in Elmira, mm -hmm. New York. Wow. So I have a question. Travis, you said in, when you were doing your video, you said, I'm called Sonny because I take after my dad. I sure as heck don't take after my mom. What, what did that, was there, is there some 
reason for that or was it just a joke? There was not. I actually oh. wish I hadn't said that, but I was like oh. you know, 20 okay. minutes in, I was like, oh man, you know, you, you do these videos like two or three times and you're like, well, that's got to be it because I'll be here all day. Um, I asked Catherine, I was like, where he has so many nicknames at the end of his life, he's referred to as Colonel, there's Captain, there's Sonny. And um, the family was like, I, I don't know as well. So I made a kind of artistic, maybe you call it an artistic expression. I was like, well, maybe it's because he folks, you know, he reminded folks of his father and his grandfather, if they both, um, not only his grandfather had military service, but if his father was kind of a prominent figure in town, it, it's clear that James Henry Dozier inherited that sense of leadership and uh, that sense of kind of um, uh, obligation to community. So I made an expression there artistically and was like, well, maybe that's why he was called Sonny. Like he, you know, um, I don't really know, but I do know that uh, uh, Colonel Dozier had, uh, my grand great grandfather, his son, Frederick Dozier, they named him Frederick after his brother that died. His name was Frederick Guthrie Dozier. And his grandson lives in Hawaii right now, named Frederick Guthrie Dozier. And Catherine, I'd love for you to share, um, so with like, um, you said Lillian and Esther and, and Catherine or Katie, how, can you share for the group your, your connection with them? Because the way you explained it, it all made sense to me and I think it's really touching. Well, they were like grandparents to my mother because their older sister, Gertie, was, um, they, those three never had children. So my mother and her sister and her brother were raised in their house too. Everybody was connected. And when I was a child, the three of them would come to our house and babysit me and my sister and Eric, and Eric my brother. <laughs> so, I named my son Eric after John Erickson, Esther's husband. But they were so much fun because they were little tiny children and they, I would eat dinner with them. We're actually in their little dining room right now because my mother lives in James Henry Dozier's house. And my favorite thing to do was to come to their house because they always had chocolate candy. <laughs> and I knew I would get my fix. And I would eat dinner with them and hang out. And they taught me how to play dominoes and we'd play old maids and all kinds of card games. They were a lot of fun. Before that, they taught me and my sister and my brother how to play all these games in this house. <laughs> we'd spend that days up here. <laughs> and well, we were just a few blocks apart. I was raised down in that big house on House Street. And we could come up here every single day to see Eddie and T and John, as we called them. <laughs> Katie was T. <laughs> and Esther was Eddie. <laughs> but they were, they were an ex, uh, another form of grandparents to us. So. Yeah. My, me, uh, me also. I always said John Erickson was like another father to me. He was wonderful. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky. We, we were lucky. a lot of family. Mm -hmm. Very and, lucky. and Annie, the oldest daughter lived right around the corner from us on Lord Street. They've just redone her house, the Annie Parker house there on Lord Street. And uh, I, I used to go around there a lot too as a child. My grandmother would give me a nickel to take her sister a, a, a bowl of collards. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd give me gum when I get there. So I, I made out good, a nickel and a gum. <laughs> And then her other sister lived down on Castle Avenue, and her brother la lived on the corner of Lord and, and Nash, where there's a brick house there now. But it was a nice, pretty built up high off the ground house where my Uncle Fred and Aunt Eula lived there. So it was a small town, and everybody was related. <laughs> so. It just, it gave me goosebumps, as you can imagine. I, not only do I very much regret it took me leaving Old Baldy to have this conversation, but you are the first person I've met that is one step removed from Old Baldhead Island. Yeah. You all are the closest connection. When you were telling me how, you know, they were like grandparents and all this time you spent listening to their stories, that's just one person removed from what we interpreted at Old Baldy. Uh, and that was just 
I, I can't even describe that feeling to be so close to what you're telling thousands of people every day who visit. Um, it was extraordinary connection to the past. It doesn't happen every day. And I'm, I'm just so thankful for that. Well, Esther, even though she was born in 1893, she stayed on Ball Head a lot, not year round. I think they came back for them to go to school, but she remembers going up with her father, changing the light, the oil and the lights. And she said it had silk that they covered the lens with in the daytime. And she remembers going up there a lot with him when she was a little girl, even, and she must've been like seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, of course, he retired in, eight, in 1912, I think, 1912, 13, and she would have been 10 years old then. No, 20 then. When in 1903, she would have been 10. But um, I think I sent you a couple of articles where the Greensboro News and Record and the Wilmington newspaper interviewed her when she was in her late 90s in the nursing home in Wilmington a couple of years before she passed away. And her mind was as sharp as a tack. Well, I gave Bob Surridge uh, a laminated article out of the newspaper That's with her picture on it. That's probably the same. Yeah. It she was. It was like her, I, that oral history or that history uh, is it, very similar to Margaret Swan Hood's history. Yes, yeah, sure. Comparable. They had similar know. experiences. I don't know if you know Karin Fisher here. I don't. Well, she was Captain Charlie Swan's granddaughter. Okay. And she's she lives up on the Cape Fear River. You've probably heard of Paul Fisher. That uh, yeah. He was an alderman. Mm -hmm. And it's her husband. Okay. Of course, he's from Southport, too. He's another. <laughs> <laughs> and Karen grew up here. Her father, and Captain Charlie Swan, of course, kept the Cape Fear Lighthouse over there. Well, you did a great job, Travis. Well, th thank you, Catherine. I appreciate that. Thank yep. you for all your help. Well, you're welcome. It was fun. <laughs> You really did do an excellent job, Travis, and I, I really um, i am so glad that you, um, after talking to Catherine, decided to portray uh, Sonny Dosher as the same age that you are now. It's a really um, interesting period of his life and, and gives an interesting perspective and, and was a better fit than if you tried to portray him at the, you know, at the end of his life, the way people envision him. So I think that was really interesting to think about struggling and trying to find a job with all the upheaval and everything that had happened and how do you find your place um, in the in the world after everything has changed so um, that was that was really great I really appreciate you doing that Thank I can you. tell you I can tell you why he left while James Henry left the light ship frying pan light ship he was seasick from the time he got on the light ship <laughs> really until and that's the reason they changed him from the light ship to the ball head lighthouse because he couldn't he couldn't function. He was couldn't function. The entire time. Uh, <laughs> found his niche then. Apparently, well, good thing he wasn't afraid of heights. That's right. <laughs> He's a little tiny short man. I would have been a head and shoulders taller than him. I'm tall. Well, that's why I got the short part down, but I couldn't grow the beard. That's what I was like. I got to do him young because I, you know, the beard is just not going to work. <laughs> All right. Does anybody have any other questions for Travis or for Catherine or Ms. Trudy? Liz, I have a question. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. Okay. Travis, uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed your presentation. My name is John Henderson. Uh, I have a tough time picturing where the plantation was. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that just a little bit more? Yeah. Um, what's the restaurant called? Um, uh, what's it, Catherine and Trudy, can you help me out there? I'm th I always think of the restaurant. That's my point of reference. If you're where South Harbor Village is and um, where Joseph's Italian Bistro is. Yes. Um, off of Fish Factory Road. Uh -huh. It was back in that area. It was from where D uh, Dutchman Creek um, is off of the Intracoastal Waterway. It right. would have been his grandfather or great-grandfather Yes, that's right. Um, Richard Dozier owned all that property that went all the way towards uh, St. James, past Beaver Creek. And 
in that area. It was a huge amount of property originally. So would it, would it have been sitting on the Elizabeth River there then? It is, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. And right so, at the very end of Fish Factory Road is where Charles Eidengoss was manager of uh, Southport Fish Scrap and Oil Company, the Manhattan business. It's out on the same property. So it's the same property. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Travis. Wonderful, wonderful job. And it was also wonderful that you brought Miss, Miss Trudy and, and Catherine to it as, as well. Um, so great, great job. I have some um, questions and comments from folks that are on, on Facebook. If you want to go, go through them. Um, Kevin, Kevin Mercer is, is wa watching. Um, Mary Ellen Watts Poole says, once again, Travis makes our history come to life. I've heard, I've heard of Mr. Sonny Dozier all my life. Great to hear, great to hear his story. And Ann Ward says she's enjoying uh, your talk. Uh, thanks from Mike Russell. Pat, Kirk, Pat Kirkman says, uh, I believe the turpentine quip, the turpentine quip. I could just <laughs> ma imagine it. So, even pulled that off for Pat anyway. <laughs> Pick for explorers are kind of responding to the question about uh, Fraser's neck, uh, that it's labeled on the map. All right, Frank Newton. Hey, Travis, you did. What did Sonny do, Dozier do during the hurricane of 1893? Oh, I know. Do you, do you know? 1893. Yeah, I have a whole program on that. And he, he came over and helped with, uh, uh, with Dunbar Davis. Am I just saying that right, Catherine? I mean, uh, Miss Trudy. He, um, Dunbar Davis was, was, uh, helped with the ships and so did Sonny Dozier. They worked yeah. together. Yeah. yeah, we have a whole program on it. And Sonny Dozier, um, Dunbar Davis was my husband that just died's great grandfather. Frank Newton also says, it's great to see Trudy and Catherine. Uh, and Pat Kirkman, thanks Catherine and Trudy for your contributions to this excellent presentation. Um, Donnie Joyner, again, great job, Travis. Great to see Trudy. Okay, that, I'm a uh, Cape Fear Explorers. I believe he is right in that it sat exactly where he said it was at the Dozier landing site. I presume that's referring to Fraser's Neck again. So those are the comments on, on Facebook and questions. Thank you. Yeah, that, that map uh, is a really great resource and it's uh, the oldbaldi.org um, Old has a link to where you can see that and really blow it up. It's not only you can see where the house was, but like where the salt works were, where the slave quarters was, that chestnut grove they talk about. You can really I couldn't blow it up as much as I wanted to on PowerPoint, but you can really zoom in. If anybody has, say, like like Catherine and, and Trudy was saying, I mean, it's, it's all developed at this point, and then the intercoastal goes through that way. So it's it's kind of hard to envision it out there nowadays. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, Travis. Thank you, um, Catherine. Thank you, Ms. Trudy. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We are, um, uh, please join us next week. Uh, Mary Ellen Watts Poole will be talking about her family's charter boat business. They were, um, I believe, the first charter boat business, or at least one of the first charter boat businesses in um, Southport. And so that's next Tuesday. And then the following Tuesday, I will be presenting on the, um, the Wilmington um, uh, uprising in and, and massacre in, in um, I've lost the date, 1898, sorry. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so much good information today. So thank you very much.